This is Dr. Michelle Cotty, and today we're going to talk about somatoform and dissociative disorders. The objectives for this lecture are to identify predisposing factors for the development of somatic illnesses, to discuss diagnostic criteria for somatoform, formulate nursing diagnoses with goals and interventions, and to discuss various therapies in prevention and treatment of somatic disorders. Patients who have somatic symptom and related disorders are usually seen in a primary care office first. It's really important that nurses are familiar with these disorders as well as their role when caring for these individuals. So somatic symptom disorders, illness anxiety disorder, conversion disorder, fictitious disorder, and psychological factors affecting other medical conditions um, will be discussed in this lecture. So somatization is the expression of psychological stress through physical manifestations. So these physical manifestations cannot be explained by any underlying pathology. Somatic manifestations cause distress for clients and often lead to long-term healthcare use. So these symptoms may be vague or exaggerated, like pressure in the head or um, chronic stomach pain with periods of remission and exacerbation. These individuals are going to spend a lot of time worrying about this physical pain to the point where it consumes their life. And they often reject a psychological diagnosis as the cause for their physical manifestations. So clients are usually seen in primary care or medicine first and then a mental health setting. Anxiety and depression can be comorbidities. Now, something that you want to be really careful of, though, is that often the other thing can happen, and that is that a very mentally ill person is overlooked when they have a serious medical condition and they're told it's their anxiety. So we want to be very careful not to do that. Somatoform disorders. In somatoform disorders, the individual complains of severe symptoms that cannot be explained by any organic or physical pathology on examination. The individual also has a highly elaborate self-diagnosis and symptoms that are refractory to reassurance, explanation, or standard treatments. And here, refractory means stubborn or resistant to treatment. These individuals really believe they have a serious medical illness. They expect the condition will worsen and they embrace being sick. They alarmingly portray the condition as catastrophic and disabling. The risk factors. A first degree relative who has a somatic symptom disorder would be a risk factor. Decreased levels of neurotransmitters, serotonin and endorphins. Depressive disorder, personality disorder, or anxiety disorder, learned helplessness, and childhood trauma, abuse, or neglect. We'd expect that these somatic manifestations disrupt the client's daily life and that they are preoccupied with them. These individuals will have an increased amount of anxiety regarding their medical symptoms, and they'll exist for more than six months. There'll be remission or exacerbation of these symptoms, and they may have alcohol or other substance use. The clients may be over-medicated with analgesics and anti-anxiety medications, and they may be using a lot of health services and multiple healthcare providers. And of course, CT scans, MRIs, and other lab tests can be performed to rule out any underlying pathology. And the PHQ-15, can be used to identify the presence of the 15 most commonly reported somatic manifestations. So these include abdominal pain, back pain, pain in the extremities and joints, menstrual problems or cramps, headaches, chest pain, dizziness, fainting, heart pounding or racing, shortness of breath, um, pain with sexual intercourse, 
problem with bowel elimination, nausea and indigestion, gas, lethargy, or sleep issues. Patient-centered care. So nurses should accept somatic manifestations as being real to the client. These clients are actually feeling the pain um, and they think that what they're telling you is real. So if somebody comes in and tells you they have crushing head pressure, do not try to convince them that they don't. Make sure you assess them for suicidal ideation and thoughts of self-harm. Identify any cultural influences that could impact the client's view of health or illness. Now, some individuals get secondary gains from somatic manifestations. What that means is maybe they get attention or they don't have to go to work or deal with an unhappy marriage because of this. Make sure that if they have any new physical manifestations, you report that to the doctor. We want to limit the amount of time that we talk about these somatic issues and encourage them to verbalize their feelings, to get exercise, to have um, be independent in self-care activities. We also want to educate them on assertiveness techniques and alternative coping mechanisms. Reattribution treatment is a way to help the individual identify the link between the physical manifestations and psychological factors while we're still showing them that we care about them and that we understand them. So there are four stages. Stage one, feeling understood. We want to have empathy, active listening, um, use therapeutic communication, and obtain a thorough health history of the manifestations while focusing on their perception of the manifestations and the cause. This is the stage that we would do the physical assessment. Stage two, we want to broaden the agenda. So acknowledge their concerns and provide feedback about what we found in the assessment. In stage three, we wanna use therapeutic communication to acknowledge the lack of a physical cause for the manifestations while allowing the client to maintain their self-esteem. And then stage four is the negotiating for the treatment stage. We wanna work with the provider and individual to develop a treatment plan that allows for regular follow-up visits. These clients may be on medications such as analgesics, antidepressants, anxiolytics, so as a nurse, you would administer those as prescribed, and we want to educate the client to go to groups, um, take their prescribed medication, and to work with their case manager to have um, follow-up appointments. We want to set follow-up appointments every four to six weeks to sort of limit um, unscheduled healthcare as well as high medical costs that are often associated with these individuals. Illness anxiety disorder. When an individual misinterprets physical manifestations and they think it's a serious disease, pro disease process, um, this can occur. Before it was known as um, people would be called a hypochondriac. Now they call it illness anxiety disorder. This can lead to obsessive thoughts and fears about illness. So you might see this um, particularly in individuals who have OCD. Clients who have this disorder are overly aware of bodily sensations and they think they're caused by a serious illness. Physical manifestations could be minimal or absent, but the individual is still preoccupied by this undiagnosed serious illness. They will repeatedly check themselves. So maybe they'll repeatedly check an elbow or a knee or moles for cancer. And they have anxiety despite negative diagnostic tests and reassurance from doctors. Nursing assessment. You would want to assess for risk factors. Do they have another relative who has the same disorder? Do they have previous losses in their life or disappointments that have resulted in feelings of anger, guilt, or hostility? 
Again, childhood trauma, abuse, or neglect are big risk factors. Do they have a depressive disorder or anxiety disorder? Remember, this may be common in OCD. Uh, major life stressors or low self-esteem are also risk factors. We would expect to find excessive anxiety that's a serious illness um, is present. Sorry, excessive anxiety that a serious illness is present um, or that it will be required. And this fear lasts for more than six months. Preoccupation with um, their performance of behaviors. So, for example, health related behaviors like breast exams or mole checks or checking to make sure their throat's not red, um, checking their blood pressure. Some clients that have this disorder may be health seeking, so they're always going to the doctor, while the other ones may be care avoidant because that also increases their anxiety. They're positive, they're gonna find out something is wrong. So again, laboratory and diagnostic tests like CAT scans or MRIs can be per performed to rule out any underlying pathology. We would want to make sure that we build rapport and trust with the client and we encourage self-care. And again, make sure they're taking their medicine as prescribed. So we would administer antidepressants or anxiolytics and educate them to go to group therapy, support groups, take their medicine, collaborate with the provider to receive brief um, office visits, tell them to talk about their feelings. We really want them to have alternative coping mechanisms and to work on their stress management techniques. So this is illness anxiety disorder, which um, was formerly known as hypochondriac. Conversion disorder is also known as functional neurological disorder. It results when an individual exhibits neurological manifestations in the absence of a neurological diagnosis. Clients who have a conversion disorder transmit emotional or psychological stressors into physical manifestations. Symptoms of conversion disorder can include deficits in voluntary motor or sensory functions like blindness, paralysis, seizures, gait disorders, or hearing loss. These individuals may have impaired balance or coordination, aphonia, so they can't talk, nausea, so they can't smell, urinary retention, a lump in the throat. A lot of times individuals have a hard time swallowing food. Hallucinations, numbness, double vision or blindness, deafness, loss of consciousness, and they can even have a false belief of pregnancy. So they can have all the signs and symptoms of pregnancy except for the confirmation of the presence of a fetus. And I've actually seen this in practice before um, in patient. So these, these manifestations can cause extreme anxiety and distress in some clients. And for others, it can exhibit a lack of emotional concern. La belle indifference. So, um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Symptoms of conversion disorder. Sigmund Freud um, who is German, spoke French, and he coined the term la belle indifference, which is an individual who is nonchalant about these symptoms. So it's an individual with con who has conversion disorder, and a third of conversion disorder cases are la belle indifference. Um, pay attention to this, it's often missed on tests. Uh, they use denial as their defense mechanism in this scenario. In this slide, you can see um, the Simpsons, Homer and gang, and they're all having pseudo seizures. So what's a pseudo epileptic, epileptic seizure? 
Well, there's a correlation between childhood trauma and pseudo epileptic ep epileptic seizures. And it's a defense mechanism against intrapsychic anxiety. So a person has so much anxiety that they have a pseudo seizure. And it's really hard to tell the difference between a pseudo seizure and an actual seizure seizure. But we will talk about that next. An average seizure lasts 18 seconds to two minutes. So that's from a focal or partial seizure all the way to a grand mal seizure. So psychogenic non-epileptic epileptic seizures, PNES seizures, um, are induced by stress and often seen in individuals who have a history of sexual or physical abuse. They are, um, usually longer, and we'll go over the symptoms of these pseudo seizures on the next slide. So there are classic clues to a pseudo seizure. Again, they last more than four minutes. They'll have waxing and waning amplitude, and they're atypical or excessive motor activity. So they might be thrashing, rolling from side to side, pelvic thrushing. There'll be a gradual onset of the convulsion and the clinical features that change from one spell to the next. So they're not consistent. There'll be resistance to eye opening and purposeful, purposeful resistance to passive movements. So some other clues is that there'll be a lack of physical energy. After the seizure, the individual is not going to have the headache or the muscle pain like they would have from a true seizure. The contracture is um, often painful after a real seizure. There'll be a lack of incontinence, a lack of the gurgling sound that you might hear, and anti-epileptic -epilept drugs would be ineffective on these individuals. Conversion disorder risk factors include first degree relatives who have the, a conversion disorder, childhood physical or sexual abuse, comorbid psychiatric conditions. So these individuals may also have depression, anxiety, PTSD, or personality disorders. They may also have comorbid medical conditions or recent acute stressful events. Um, adolescents or young adults or individuals who are female are more likely to have a conversion disorder, as are individuals who have a low socioeconomic status or a low educational status. We would expect them to have voluntary motor or sensory function alterations. So paralysis, movement or gait disorders, seizure-like movements, blindness, inability to speak, smell, um, numbness, deafness, tingling or burning sensations. Individuals with an extreme desire to become pregnant can actually manifest a false pregnancy. Again, laboratory and diagnostic, diagnostic tests can be performed to rule out uh, medical pathology. And the nursing care is similar to the other disorders in this lecture. So we want to build rapport and trust with clients, ensure they're safe. We want them to talk about their feelings. Um, we want them to use alternative coping mechanisms and educate them on stress management techniques. The incidence of remission and recurrence here are high. So remission occurs without intervention in approximately 95% of people. So they might see this onset in acutely stressful events. Relapse rate is approximately 20% within a year of the initial diagnosis. So I've seen patients who can't swallow when they have stressful um, parental situations. And then with no intervention, you just ignore it, it goes away and doesn't come back. So sometimes you don't really need to do anything for the conversion disorders. Um, helping the individual get out of the stressful event can resolve this. 
So medications, administer medications as prescribed, that'd be antidepressants or anxiolytics, client education, participate in individual group therapy, attend community support groups or utilize prescribed medications. So development of certain medical conditions like heart disease or cancer are linked to individuals who have depressive or anxiety disorders. So you can't have real medical issues from these dis from having depression and anxiety. So remember to always take physical complaints seriously. Um, but again, with conversion disorder, same individual comes in and they're in a, in a job situation. It's really stressful. Um, and they hate it and they have an issue with tingling and burning or have a hard time speaking at times. Sometimes if they leave the stressful job situation, those symptoms go away, which sounds um, unusual. But again, I have seen this happen. Fictitious disorder, which was previously known as Munchausen syndrome, is a choice by a client to report physical or psychological manifested symptoms, and they're not true. So they're pretending like they have a physical or mental illness. And they do this um, in the absence of personal gain by the client other than the fulfillment of an emotional need for attention. In some cases, the clients inflict self-injury. So when this disorder is imposed on another person, it's Munchausen syndrome by proxy. It's when the client deliberately causes injury or illness to a vulnerable person. And the emotional need for attention or relief of responsibility remains a possible motivating factor. So these individuals have an average or above average IQ and they're very dramatic in describing the illness. They use proper medical terminology and is often hesitant for the provider to speak to the family member or prior providers. They report new symptoms all the time. Um, if they have a negative test result, then there are new manifestations of the disease. Mm -hmm. This differs from malingering because um, fictitious disorder is a mental illness while malingering is not. Malingering is like consciously motivated and driven by personal gain to like avoid military or get disability benefits or because they're homeless, where fictitious disorder is an emotional need for attention. No one's surprised, a fictitious disorder is pretty challenging to treat. Um, clients often resist changing their thought patterns. This always requires long-term intervention and management. And care providers have to recognize these syndromes and treat them accordingly or refer to psychiatric care. So nursing diagnoses we could use for these clients include ineffective coping, anxiety, powerlessness, chronic low self-esteem, social isolation, and an interrupted family processes. For planning and implementation, establish a trusting relationship. Spend less time focusing on physical symptoms and make fewer trips to the healthcare provider. Demonstrate increased self-esteem by verbalizing positive statements, demonstrate increased level of ADLs and more social outings, and gain coping strategies to replace somatization for coping with stress. So these are some of the goals that we wanna have for these patients. Individual and group psychotherapies. Cognitive behavioral therapy would be the choice. Um, and you'll probably see a common theme. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a really good therapy choice for a lot of disorders. 
Psychiatric medication is of limited use. SSRIs um, are often the drug of choice. Biofeedback, meditation, and relaxation therapies can also be helpful. That concludes this lecture. Here are the preferences.